Hi there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Cloud Base Mayhem. My guest today is Jeff Longcourt. I sat down with Jeff when I was out training in California in March, and I had a lot of requests for Jeff, especially after we put out that survey that people found it really valuable to talk to lower hour pilots, those that are uh, firmly in kind of intermediate syndrome and getting through that rather than just talking to the legends and the pros. And so this is one of those. Jeff's been chasing it really hard. Uh, he's a search and rescue professional and he's, you know, he's got a good head, but he doesn't get to get out that much because of his job and his work. And he's made some mistakes, some small ones, some big ones, as we all do. He's had some injuries and gone through that whole, God, do I suck at this? Should I quit? And he's in a very dynamic community out there in Santa Barbara. It's a really supportive community. It's fantastic. And, but it's also can be, there can be a lot of pressure there. Not that people are doing it to you intentionally, but there's just, uh, you know, there's a lot of people chasing it really hard and, and you want to be part of that group. Um, he's recently put up some, some great flights, uh, also recently broke his ankle and that was wasn't real recent but and we we take through we go through all of this in some detail you know the 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 urge to quit and come back to it uh questioning yourself doubt and how to approach risk when you don't really understand it that well yet and um yeah, the power of making inexpensive and sometimes expensive mistakes. How to deal with relationships, you know, if you're with, you're with somebody who uh, isn't a pilot, that can obviously be tricky for many of us in our in our lives. And how to learn how to how the value of acro and SIV training, and yeah, just being a part of of a great community and. I think you'll really enjoy this. I really like Jeff. He's, he's super fun to talk to and his stoke is incredibly contagious and I think you'll enjoy it. So without further delay, please enjoy this fun conversation with Jeff Longcore. Jeff, awesome to have you on the show and uh, really cool that we can do this in person. This is kind of fun. We had a nice flight together the other day. That was really cool. You and Neil and I were in the air a bit for, for a while. I didn't know it was you, but that was fun. There's a lot of gliders around here, but so yeah, we're in Santa Barbara. We're sitting in my trailer and I'm just about getting ready to go home. And when this comes out, it'll be a couple months from now. So uh, sorry to the listeners that some of this might have changed by the time you, you hear this, but what I thought would be a fun place to start, you put up a post recently on the Telegram group out here for the Santa Barbara flying community and the club, which I think there's 800 and something people on the Telegram group now. And so this has obviously become kind of a mecca to fly here. And for those of you who haven't flown, it's a coastal site in a sense, but also a mountain site. We're right on the ocean here, a uh, big 3,500 foot peaks and a big ridge line behind us. And then it steps back another 1,000, 1,500 feet behind that. And then beyond that, you're out in the Mojave Desert. So it's a, it's a pretty dynamic, very beautiful, very cool place to fly. It's often soft and it's sometimes it's, it winds up and it's pretty, pretty high pressure, pretty sharp and, and pretty full on flying. So it's a great place for me to come and train and it's also a wonderful place for people to come out and learn literally from the, their first flight at one of the best training hills in the world. And then also to excel and get better and train as I know you have in the last few years. So this is a long winded opener, but what I thought we'd start with is you're, you, there's a, there was a pilot here in the community that was having some incidences as we all do when we're coming up through the game and you posted what I thought was really good constructive feedback that was, you know, non-judgmental and very welcoming and kind of in asking this pilot to maybe look at things in a way that he hadn't. So 
without reading it, it's a long post, but it really got a lot of attention and, and some great responses. And I, I thought you might be able to just summarize that. So what what led to you writing it? What were the things that that uh, this pilot did that that led to you writing the post? And and then take us into your own journey a little bit. Awesome. Thanks so much, Gavin, for having me. I, I've listened to every single episode. It's uh, changed my progression, made me a safer pilot. And uh, that's the kind of information and thought process that I tried to pass on in what I wrote. And uh, I, I totally agree with you. Santa Barbara is a beautiful place to fly with varying conditions throughout the seasons. And one of the best things about it is there's something flyable almost every day. And that allows us to train in ways that build skill levels incrementally in different aspects of flying and then combine them together in mountain flights that, like you said, can extend into different uh, terrain and into uh, new places, different valley systems, um, into the backcountry or into the desert. Uh, many of those I'm still looking forward to myself. Um, I Again, I, I am fairly intermediate. I've been flying for three years only. In those years, though, I've, I've worked really hard to understand how to become a better pilot and to use all of the resources available to me right now while working uh, a full-time desk job. And so uh, in that time, I've, I've logged about 700 hours and I've decided to do about um, seven SIVs. And those things, I think, have been totally critical. And the, the reason I felt like I could reach out to this pilot is because I was that pilot when I started. I, uh, the way I phrased it was that my joy of flying was outpacing my abilities. I think a lot of people at the time when I, when I had started felt that I was competing with them or trying to uh, get notoriety or outfly others, but really it was like this overwhelming joy, like the need to want to launch, right? Like the, mm. like the need to want to experience what other people were experiencing when they had a big flight, when they flew to a new place, when they had an evening soaring session in a high wind environment, but that the watch the sunset, you know, and that, that kind of stuff really, uh, I think can capture a new pilot. And it's, it's, you've talked about this too. It, it really, that's special to embrace it during that time. Cause that's the unique period where like everything is magical and new, but at the same time, I think there's a lot of risk during that phase. You know, if you see someone in the air, you want to be in the air and that that's not always appropriate and you might not be aware of conditions changing quickly. Mm. We don't know what we don't know for a long time. And I think that's, uh, it's, it's something I think when you get through that, you wrestle with looking back in terms of just how to, how to approach people in a, in a positive way, how to try to understand what they're going through. It's, it's really tricky. It's, uh, I just, I think I wrote on the on a post this morning, that, like Russ Ogden says, we're not playing golf. It's hard to, <laughs> you know, you can't just go up and help somebody with their grip or with their backswing. It's, you know, we're, we're playing with gravity. Right. And not only that, but we're totally alone. Like, I think, yeah. I think that's something that caught me off guard at first. I come from climbing, you know, when you have a partner, you or multiple partners and you're relying on each other for your life uh, and, and you have that trust and that bond, we can fly together, but ultimately no one knows how I'm, how I'm piloting my craft, what mm -hmm. techniques I'm using, uh, what thought process is going on in my head. And uh, you can't reach out and save somebody, mm -hmm. you know, that you can try to communicate on the radio or, uh, or give signals, but we're, we're kind of out there on our own a little. And that was, that was a bit of a shock for me at first. And so I think you're absolutely right. It's not like someone can come in and look over your shoulder. Mm. You know, I highly encourage people to do a tandem. Uh, Eagle makes that part of their, their training. And I learned a lot from Mitch when I took a tandem with him. But other than that, like someone can't step in and improve your technique or your decision making in the moment. Mm. And those moments are uh, high, high consequence at times. So what summarize very generally, what was this pilot? What, what, what had happened? Uh, in, I mean, not, not each incident, but what was generally happening that you were trying to mitigate in a sense? Oh, absolutely. I, I thought a lot before I wrote that response because I wanted to make sure it was necessary. I'm not going to judge 
any pilot who has one incident, I've had plenty. So if they have one incident, um, you know, that's, that's one thing. Um, if it's a, if it's a string of incidences, if it's a, uh, a series of them, um, that become a trend, I think in any activity and anything you do in life, if that's happening, you need to take a step back and mm. do a bit of a more of a root cause analysis and understand why is that trend happening? Because it, if you don't do that, if you don't address it, it can only end badly. I think mm -hmm. um, so eventually yeah. the luck jar is going to run out. Right, right. You're getting away with it each time. And and again, if there's something that you don't know, uh, you know, you're putting yourself in positions that you're you aren't aware of the risks involved there. You you have to take a step back and analyze it and and fill in those gaps in in environments that are less consequential. And so in this case. The pilot had had, at the time that I responded, I believe two reserve throws, an incident of getting lost in the clouds, uh, an incident of landing really deep and having to hike out with no plan or equipment for an overnight, uh, and a couple of reports of maybe not having great situational awareness in gaggle flying situations, mm -hmm. uh, scenarios. Um, in each one of these, I did monitor the community response and felt compelled to say something, but really also felt like it was being handled. And in the last reserve throw incident, I felt the community started to get split where some of the response was great for you for throwing. That's the right thing to do. And the other half being, Oh man, we should maybe give up. Like it's not really being heard. And I don't think it's ever worth giving up on a pilot. Um, I was that pilot, you know, I was, I was, so excited and I was so charged and it, and I remember it hurting pretty bad when I got the feedback and I, I still tried to receive it and, and listen to it and think about it a lot. And even if it made me upset and it took time for it to work its way into my head, you know, and it took time for me to make those small adjustments or have these epiphanies or slow down and watch others and read a little bit more or listen to these podcasts and really embrace the wider world of knowledge and, and the slower states of progression. And so I thought it was definitely worthwhile to write something, but it had to marry those two perspectives of good job throwing, because I would never tell someone not to throw a reserve, you know, mm -hmm. that obviously the person walked away in all of these instances. Sure. And that was clearly the right decision. If you don't have the wing control to uh, stop what's happening to, to recognize configurations and find an exit and safely maneuver. And then I also had to balance like that feeling of you better listen, you know, if it was coming from the other side of the community of, you know, we're, re we're ready to kind of give up, you know, ready to, to not reach out to this person anymore and, and be like, look, this is just hazardous for everybody. Mm -hmm. So how do you combine those two things together and, and be it, do it in a non judgmental way that says, look, I've been there too, because mm -hmm. I, I certainly have been. And we can, we can talk about some of my mistakes. A little let's little bit, let, but let's go ahead and switch to that, and then we'll come back to the okay. talk. So, what 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 were your own? Because I, I feel like in some ways, maybe your own incidences that were similar in a sense uh, may have better equipped you to understand where this pilot was. I because I, I, I agree with you. I think from the wider community's perspective, I mean, let's face it: some people just shouldn't be pilots. Um, you know, some people don't belong in this sport and that's one of the reasons I think it's, it doesn't have the growth, you know, we're, we're very near, a, a, a metropolitan center of 30 million people, you know, why aren't there more pilots? They see people flying in the mountains. It looks incredible. I'm sure to many, um, but not that many people undertake it. And that's probably a good thing, but you, it sounds like you were really equipped to, I mean, I think I, I, I'm sympathetic with both sides of what you're saying here uh, in terms of the community. Half the community, or some parts of the community, are, we got to keep trying. Some parts of the community, like this, maybe this person shouldn't, you know, should take up a different activity. Right, right, and it's. I think it's hard to care for someone if they're gonna, if, if they're if they're not handling themselves appropriately and might get hurt. And and I think we all feel that amongst our friends in the sport. Sometimes it's like if someone's taking a lot of risks, you're like, oh, can I? can I be close with that person? Can mm -hmm. I be a friend if, if they're putting their life on the line? And uh, in some ways that is what binds us. Mm -hmm. You know, we're out there pushing and we have to understand that we all have days when we need to push. But again, I think it comes back to recognizing that trend. If you're pushing too many times, 
you have to take a step back and, and, and also listen to the feedback you're getting from people who care about you. Mm. And what I love about Santa Barbara's community is we care about everyone. And a lot of it can be self-serving because if we get a new pilot who comes in who doesn't follow the, the rules on the website and doesn't do some of their own forecasting and take responsibility for themselves, we can lose a lot of our access here. Um, as you said, it is a beautiful place to fly, but it's also a busy place. And so though we've been very diligent about putting up rules that, that we'd like people to follow, um, there is a wonderful uh, van service from Eagle uh, that they'll run when they can. And they still will encourage people to do their own forecasting or uh, to reach out to a mentor to get that kind of information. And so I think that the community does want to care for everyone, but it does scare them when they see these trends specifically, not just one incident, but a pilot having a, a series. And for me, yes, I think I was that pilot. And, you know, one of the funniest, and it's only funny because it worked out, right? But one of the funnier scenarios uh, was I think I was going up for a second run, um, flying from EJ, which is a fairly straightforward launch uh, at, at the back ridge that we have here. And the wind had picked up quite a bit. Again, one of those situations with the conditions changing fairly quickly to the later stages of the day, which is typical here, a wind will come in a southwest or west wind is is predictable on most days and there's an instructor there and he was giving me a look sort of like you know do you do you have this do you know what you're doing you know he was instructing others and, and kind of driving the van i think that had gone up mm -hmm. and right it's i believe i was a p2 at the time and i think that's a really really critical point here because of someone's development in Santa Barbara because you're on a lower performance wing and our launches are a bit set back. There are power lines, there are valleys, uh, and you need to be thoughtful about the wind. You need to be thoughtful about your flight plan. I think one of your, one of your bailout LZs is called a snake pit. And yeah. I, that ought to tell people what it's like. Yeah. yeah it's, that, it's, that's it's got like, a key, yeah. uh, key part in the story yeah, you, <laughs> you can see where i'm going yeah you don't want to be buried back in there oh yeah it's a tight a tight lz uh, especially if you're ended up there because it's windy mm -hmm. you know and if it is windy it's probably up slope and uh that means that you're going to be doing a fast downwind uphill landing mm -hmm. if you do it properly mm -hmm. now in this scenario i uh arrived at one of our forward triggers it was working okay and i'd seen uh, a couple of tandem pilots bench back and i thought this is my time. I want to bench back. You know, the wind's going to help me too. It's a south wind. And, uh, you know, I'm benching back to the north and I make the move. And of course, uh, don't quite uh, hook into anything and start flushing off. And I flush off to that side with the snake pit, which has fewer exits and is blocked by power lines uh, to, to get to a safe LZ other than the snake pit. And so pretty quickly realize I'm going there. <laughs> You know, I'm going in and, uh, and I thought, you know, other, other, other pilots have pulled this off. I'm going to pull this off. And I angled my approach to come in really low over the trees, which I think that's definitely the right move there. You know, you got to hit that spot landing. And, uh, at the last minute decided to get a little tricky with my landing. And I, I think I'd recently had a hard landing a few days prior. And so in my head, I was thinking, I really don't want to do an uphill downwind landing. I'm going to turn at the last second and, and land in the, you know, the upper part of that LZ and get a nice, uh, asymmetric flare or something like that. And I came in and I swear my feet like touched the ground. And I was like, I thought I was there. And then I get boosted into the air and suddenly I'm flying like tree height down a Canyon with no LZ whatsoever. <laughs> so you, like, over, you overflew it going down. Yeah. I, I essentially made a turn. Um, and pointed myself down canyon and it's it's a pretty you can't really tell from the air uh it's a pretty steep uh downhill at that point mm -hmm. so i went from facing north and doing that uphill landing to facing south now and flying downhill mm -hmm. and there's uh you know i i think if i do that now i i may have the wing control skills to uh kill the wing appropriately and put that landing in uh, at the time i certainly didn't and i thought about some of the advice I'd gotten and I thought, well, I'm going to land in a tree and uh, I'm going to aim for a soft one. Then, <laughs> So I dodged a hard looking tree and I made a, a turn and, and did a full flare into a uh, kind of a glorified bush and I landed. And the next thing I know, I'm, I think I was hanging by one leg upside down in the tree, <laughs> about four feet over the ground. 
and I was able to get the whole wing down. And I, and it's, this is really funny. I, even though I had a reversible harness, I still carry the huge Niviac black backpack. Yeah. And that helped me a few times in my early progression. Cause I could pack the whole wing into it. Yeah. So just stuff the whole wing into it and just like walk the beautiful trail down, um, with my tail between my legs. And there, there's a tandem pilot who was also my SIV instructor, Dylan Beddetti, and he called me on the phone. I think he was still in the air. It was just, you know, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm already packed up. And I remember him being pretty surprised, like, oh, you're already packed <laughs> up. Like, you know, and it was clear. I, I was trying to get out of there pretty fast. I was super embarrassed. And I thought I was totally in the clear, like uh, no injuries whatsoever. Um, but then I get home and uh, I, I'm from New England and, and uh, we don't have a lot of poison oak up there. <laughs> I had no oh, idea. Man. So before I know it, everyone in in my myself and and uh, my girlfriend were just covered with poison oak because oh. like we did, you know, the clothes got everywhere. And yeah, it's just uh, unbelievable. And I thought it would go away, and before I know it, I'm getting like a you know shots in the in the butt. You know what I mean? Oh. <laughs> to get rid of that stuff. Oh. So we there's some things in California like there's not a lot of. Um, you know, mosquitoes or bugs. Um, but man, some of the things here can get you. Like yeah, the bushwhacking sure. can be brutal and the uh the heat sometimes can be brutal and the poison oak can be insane. Yeah, landing out here, uh, you know, the front range is is one thing and but when you when you huck it over the back and get into chaparral country and stuff, you know, you're when I look at that stuff, I always think, Okay, I could put it in and I'm not gonna die. But then I slip my wrists because I'm not going to be able to walk out of this crap either. You know, I mean, you'd have to abandon your gear. There's no way you're getting it out of one of those trees. And then, you know, it's thick. I mean, the the thick stuff on the backside here is, uh, it would be torture. It would be brutal. Oh, my God. I I had a, a situation where I landed. Uh, I got, again, I, I think one of the things that really challenges new pilots and one of the things I advise this pilot to be more thoughtful about was flying in wind. And I, I remember falling out of the back of a thermal, uh, this is a bit later in my progression and getting kind of pinned against the terrain. And I realized I'm going to land here, you know, I was up near where you top landed the other day, the OR, but just to get shallow to the West. Okay. And I landed there and I swear I could throw a stone to the road. And two and a half hours later, I crawled under the bushes and got out of there. Oh. It's amazing. It's, it was like a football field away, you know, but I couldn't get there. I had to walk for hours and then crawl underneath. Uh, this, oh. this wooded brush so so it is it is pretty real um and and you know i can reflect on a few of those situations then the the biggest one probably for a new pilot in the mountains is to be aware of those changing conditions and the wind especially mm -hmm. right because all of a sudden things happen so much faster mm -hmm. uh whether it's falling out of a thermal or getting stuck behind terrain or other traps that prevent you from getting to a safe lz with a lower performance glider yeah and so like in that situation, that was a great takeaway, not listening to that uh, instructor, you know, who I greatly respected. And, and, you know, just because I thought I've practiced high wind launches before and I've ridge soared in high wind before, that's not the same in the mountains. Yeah. Right. And that's Definitely. lesson learned right there. <laughs> yeah. So you had the snake pit one. You've had some others. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like I said, it's it's always a series. And uh, to the community's credit, I, you know, they informed me you know, after these and, 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 or they were, you know, very respectfully honest, you know, and I, again, it was, it's hard things to hear, but if you're, if your mind and ears aren't open to it, you could risk life-changing injury, I think, in this sport. Mm. And so I've tried to challenge my ego to be accepting, more accepting of hearing everything I can, mm. or even be, you know, learning from others, you know? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Pick out a couple. Yeah, right? definitely. What are, what yeah. are the, what are the, what were the ones that had the greatest learning? Yeah, I'd say of all of them. Um, and we'll just go with this one and then I can, I can do more. I can go all day, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, I think one of the, the, the absolute biggest one was a morning when I was really excited to do a hike and fly. Uh, that's been a, uh, something really special to me because I have this history in mountaineering and that is kind of what led to me flying, you know, climbing and mountaineering. Uh, and the legacy of that sport transitioning into some people who fly like the Bill Bell courts, you know, and, and, and the legends of, of how climbers became paragliders and, and the magic of flying off a mountain and not having to hike downhill and destroy your knees, you know, that kind of thing. And so I did this hike and fly mission, um, 
I'm going to start throwing out names. So, so I was with Andrew Byron, who is just an amazing, uh, thoughtful pilot and friend. He's, he's got incredible wing control and, and like the foundational skills. Mm. And so we hiked up together and someone had told me that there'd been a North wind warning, which is our mountains face South and we're launching to the South. So that'd be coming over the back on us. And that's typical here in Santa Barbara. And I had expected that to change in the morning. And when we got there, it felt like it was blowing in, uh, but but only very lightly and inconsistently. And I knew I was nervous about the launch, but I didn't say anything. Like, I didn't bring it up to Andrew. And in fact, we were rushing, or at least in my head, I was rushing to launch, land, and then get, catch the Eagle van <laughs> for another round, you know? Right. Maybe I could do two or three. And that kind of thing is typical in the summer where conditions are stable, so you're looking as a new pilot for multiple sledders. And again, I think that we, because the conditions are sort of soft and stable, you don't think they're going to change that much or that the morning will be that different. Um, I know that impacted a pilot recently here who launched in the afternoon and it was totally different from his morning flight. And you got to, you know, you said this before, but you got to treat every flight as its own uh, life changing adventure, mm -hmm. right? It's its own uh, unique experience in evaluating the conditions every time. Um, at least that was one of my takeaways, but I, uh, set up on launch and, uh, before I think I'd even had a chance to turn around from laying out my wing at, at Skyport, which is where we were, uh, Andrew had been able to forward off and, and to my, to, to this day, it blows my mind, uh, having someone forward off Skyport. Uh, it is like three steps and then you're off. Um, we recently, there was some bushes cleared there. And so now it's way better uh the things that i'm about to tell you probably aren't as likely <laughs> to happen to the next pilot and i'm really grateful for uh the improvements that have that have occurred um but andrew andrew got off and it was you know he did it in a beautiful way um just really demonstrating his his skill and ability there and again the cycles were really light inconsistent and switchy and at that time you know as as a pilot i'm more of like a feeling pilot like i think You've talked about this. There's analytical minds uh, that look at all the data, and then there's more of the emotional and feeling pilots, and there's positive and benefits to both. And one of the negatives, I think, to my approach at the time being one of those types of pilots is I'd feel like a what felt like a good cycle and go, well, this is good. Let's do it. You know, like, let's pull up. Let's make it happen. Like, I'm ready. And uh, I've, you know, since then, it's I've tried to incorporate that observation and that data component to launching, I think it's the most critical aspect of a flight in most cases, right? You got to get away from terrain safely. Mm. And so not just feeling the cycles, but really looking at the bushes and how they move. And, you know, one person I talked to at length after this is Logan, because he, you know, he, Logan, uh, Logan Andrew and I, and a, and a bunch of others have really kind of started in the same couple years ballpark. And uh, his progression has been really impressive to watch and a lot of that is because he analyzes these things and he thinks about them in his free time and he visualizes them and so you know talking to him he's like if you know i know if that bush is moving and then that bush is moving and then this one is moving like that that's what that means you know and piecing those things together and none of that was there for me that day like i didn't do those things i was curious did you have you you said though when you first got there you had a sensation of you know something's not right or you were yeah. a little bit nervous. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I knew that I didn't have great light wind launching skills. I was on, um, and we can, I guess, talk about wings a little bit too, but I I had uh, recently stepped up to a higher B mm -hmm. and I was kiting a lot, but with my lower B, you know, so I hadn't, I think that's really important early in your progression is to um, match your, or just or just embrace one wing you know, at least early on mm. so that the wing you're kiting all day at the hill and practicing landings with and things is also that wing that you can trust in a mountain launch of any type. And so I'd, I'd recently changed wings a little bit. So I was probably nervous there. And then not just was it light, but I think once in a while it would blow down a little bit. Mm. So I think that North was still there. And I didn't have at the time the sense to check wind talkers better, check the forecast better. Uh, understand. I, I, I remember learning in ground school about how it could rotor over the top and feel like it was coming in, mm. you know, but at, at the time I was like, you know, I, I just figured I was nervous about the launch, but I was going to do it anyway. 
I think I think a lot of early pilots do the same thing where launch is a foregone conclusion. Like sure. I came all the way up here, I hiked up here, I want to make the van, but I'm nervous about it. And and you don't really listen to why. But when you look back on the root cause, if you do that root cause analysis, you're like, wow, there's a lot of things yeah. like a newer wing uh, early in the morning. So not as settled. Uh, the north maybe hadn't blocked and there was a there was a possible north wind warning. Um, didn't check any wind talkers to do any forecasting. You know, another really good pilot had to forward launch off and I'm not prepared to do that. You know, so those all of those things and not talking to someone about them were all mistakes. Mm. Absolutely. And so. I thought I felt a pretty good cycle. Uh, I didn't check all the visual indicators that it would be a consistent one. I pulled up. Uh, the wing was probably slow to come up, and I didn't really set up as high as I could have. I only had a couple steps by the time I turned around. In fact, I basically just slid off the lip, and it's a steep drop off, but there are a lot of bushes and rocks. And I caught my foot on the first bush, and then the next bush, and then the next bush. And I kind of visualize it now like one of those cartoons where, like, the paraglider is flying straight and level above me, but I'm getting dragged through every bush and it's slowing down. And then finally I hit a rock and it, with my left foot and I hit it so hard that my shoe disappeared forever. Whoa. I never found it again. <laughs> it came off and it, I went back and looked for a couple hours. This was like a point of personal pride. I'm like, I need to like own this. Where did that shoe go? You know, it's expensive, like Solomon shoe. And I never, um, never That's found so it again. Terrible. Yeah, it was gone. <laughs> it was not annihilated. I think it's in pieces. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I've never to that point, despite all my climbing injuries, which I've racked up like one surgery per limb. And then this, this left, actually this left uh, ankle, which broke in, in this accident was like my, my completed the circle of limb injuries. <laughs> but in, in all my injuries, I'd never broken something. I, I think I have pretty strong bones and I hit that rock really hard. Wow, yeah. that must have really hurt. Yeah, this place can bite. I remember I came here two years ago. I was training for the, uh, I guess that would have been, the, or maybe three years ago. I was training for one of the X Alps, and I went in the trees off that launch you guys have off the road. You know, the one where you kind of you're kind of like running uphill a little bit, mm -hmm. and uh, and I just you know I just didn't the wing wasn't quite pressurized, and now it, a few people got off that morning, and then. For me, backwards, nobody got off. The, the conditions had switched and it just wasn't really coming up. And so I just tried to do a really, really fast running forward and just went right in the trees. And then I think a day later, I got low back in your mountains where it gets pretty flat back here by Casitas Pass. And, you know, like you said, you, you, you're not going to make the glide if you're low. And I landed in another tree. <laughs> <laughs> and and I thought, wow, this is really interesting. I'm an ex Alps pilot, and I've landed in trees. I think it was two days in a row. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not the kind where you're hanging out of it. It was just, you know, this, the second one. The both of them were the kind of thing where I was on the ground and my wing was in the tree. But it's, you know, the extraction was an hour. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you're like, oh, this is going to be a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're tangly. They're tangly bushes and trees. Yeah, it goes yeah, back to that whole bushwhacking theory yeah. back here. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So you broke your ankle. Yeah. Yeah. I broke it. And, and, uh, in a lot of ways it was a blessing. And that's why I say that not only did I learn from all, you know, if I had gotten weird that I wouldn't learn a thing probably. Right. Sure. But then you get, you have that happen. And not only did I learn from all the factors of the accident, but I also, uh, was forced to have downtime. And that's something I still struggle to make myself do. Right. I, you know, if I look back on my progression, it's like, Oh, Actually, if I'd flown a little bit less, like, you know, the airtime, you get that event, you know, as you go. But if I'd done a little more of the uh, reading and the research and the homework, and that caused me to sit down and do some of that, at least. I think I read 50 Ways to Fly Better, and I started to listen to every one of these episodes mm -hmm. of Cloud Based Mayhem to start. And then I watched uh, YouTube videos of Greg Hammerton and uh, fail videos of people crashing and, and, uh, a lot of the community so less more 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 knowledge less excitement yeah or more um, brakes less gas yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> yeah yeah let's uh, coast for a while um I, I think in this this letter that i the open letter that i wrote on telegram to this other pilot i i phrased it to uh kind of to the effect of um this this reading helped me fill in the gaps of what i was feeling we don't know what we don't know and by reading and incorporating other people's experiences, we start to fill in 
those gaps. And then the next time you do get airtime, it starts to piece together better. Mm. You throw in a reserve a couple times. <laughs> yeah, this is good. <laughs> oh, I feel like getting a lot off my chest here. <laughs> yeah. Air it out, man. Yeah. Air it out. Well, um, one thing after these accidents that I so greatly appreciate is the community again, right? So when what I found is if it's if it's a small incident, they let you they really let you know about it and, and it can be kind of um you know, sometimes I walked away and feel like, well, that was intense and maybe a little negative. Like I had someone scream at me once that I was turning the wrong way in a thermal as a new pilot. I got like boosted into the thermal and um, we're like best friends now. Um, <laughs> shout out to Jason Lombard. Thanks for the correction on that one. Um, you know, and, and I think that, that stemmed from learning experience where you went from, you know, a ridge soaring and you got boosted up into a thermal. Right. So that's a really difficult thing, I think, for new pilots is to change the, the rules or the pattern. Right. And adjust appropriately and be aware of the situation. And so there were moments like that, that where it were minor errors and people were able to catch me on them. And I was like, whoa, that was intense. But when it was a serious accident, I got serious phone calls of people who really cared. Mm. And um, one of those people is, again, that SIV instructor, Dylan Benedetti, uh, who called after my uh, I broke my ankle. Mm. And uh, <laughs> the funny part about, again, about that accident was, I had exploded the airbag on my harness and I'd given it to Eagle to maybe fix. And they, they put a tag on it that says airbag quote, doesn't hold air. <laughs> Just the entire thing was like exploded. Um, but that got, you know, did get fixed uh, eventually, but I, um, he had seen that picture. Dylan had seen the picture of the airbag and thought I'd been seriously injured. And he gave me this meaningful phone call and others did as well. You know, uh, any of the, uh, the crew here in, in the community, when something really serious does happen, like, there's no judgment, you know, and I've, I've learned that lesson too. There's no judgment. And, and what the community does look for then in any, either the small or the big incidences, I think, is steps for correction. And I want to be the person who, and I think any pilot should also be the person who uh, steps up and puts the work in. Mm. So if you've had an issue or a series of events, um, you should put the work in. You should tell others you're putting the work in and ask for their help. And so at that time, I decided that, um, doing more SIV was going to be really important. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in SIV, and this is a long way to answer your reserve question, but in SIV, I had the reserve come out accidentally doing a deep stall where I, I uh, popped it out. You know, I, I grabbed it with my hand by accident, mm -hmm. trying to hold uh, a bad stall configuration. And uh, it's funny because I wanted to blame like the the zipper on the harness, but when Logan and Galen pulled me out of the water, they're like, oh yeah, it's totally the zipper. And then later they're like, dude, that was you. <laughs> like, there's the zipper doesn't, doesn't do that. <laughs> right. Like you definitely plucked your pins out there. Yeah. Um, you know, we had a good laugh about it, but what it gave me in that unique experience was that's what a reserve feels like, or that's what it feels like when it comes out. This is how we disable my wing quickly. And uh, I think having it, that's another example of being able to practice those things in a low consequence environment. And then when you're in the mountains, those pieces can come together uh, and, and really help you in the critical situations that would otherwise be uh, extremely damaging. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, my real in the wild reserve toss was, yeah, pretty full on. I went on my first desert mission ever and admittedly was exhausted on the drive in mm -hmm. the morning. I think I had been working really late. I had an ankle injury that was bothering me, the same broken ankle, I think, okay. right? It was still lingering. Um, I had recently moved it from the Calibri, which I was really enjoying uh, as as a nice sensitive lightweight harness that I could do hike and fly with, to a bigger harness mm -hmm. um, that while it had more protection, I think was more dampened. Mm. So, so all these little factors aren't huge in the story, but I think they all add up. Sure. It always does. It always does, yeah. yeah. So we get there and there's a lot of debate about, do we fly it or do we fly it Blackhawk? Um, I, again, I'm tired and I'm a little stressed and this is stressing me out more. And eventually, you know, people are may, trying to make a decision and wandering away to sort their gear and then coming back and we see the clouds popping and let's go, you know? Yeah. And, uh, before I know it, I volunteer to go to the other site and we're at Ord. So I volunteer to go to Blackhawk. And, uh, again, without really doing a good head count, we all just jump into one car and go. There was an I don't think we all had the wherewithal to really plan logistics well. And so I end up in the trunk, literally on top of Othar 
who <laughs> I didn't know who he was at the time, right? But we are on top of each other. Uh, the car has a lot of trouble getting up there. I think it, I think credit to the driver, it had like two run on flats. It's got two hang gliders on it and like six paragliding bags. It's a, like wow. a BMW SUV. <laughs> it's like nice. no place being there. We have to walk a lot. My ankle's killing me. So by the time I get there, I'm probably compromise yeah right? and um but still have maybe this inflated confidence you know and the same thing that maybe got me on that launch before where i broke my ankle kind of crept in here which is that like i got this you know yeah. and i think it's important to have the self-assurance when you launch to sure. do to do it confidently but i feel like in paragliding anytime you're like oh i got this it's gonna slap you down mm. like that extra bit of arrogance perhaps right you know Oh, confidence versus arrogance then yeah that's important yeah hard to be able to differentiate that in the <sighs> yeah at, at the in the moment though i mean there because there's a lot of there have been a lot of times in my flying life where you know i'll have the heebie-jeebies for some reason you know driving up hiking up just something doesn't feel right and you have to decide okay is this heebie-jeebie this time is this a real one you know, is it the, is it the one that's really trying to help me out or is this just my mind with the weird stuff going on between the ears? And this is, you know, that it just doesn't mean anything. It's just a matter of setting that aside and being confident. No, well, no, I got this, you know, that's hard to, it's hard to sometimes differentiate between those two. Yeah. I think it's, that's the sport in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. like, do I, do I, I got this or not? not? Yeah, there you go. Okay, podcast done. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're yeah, wrapping yeah, it exactly. up. I think for me, it's uh, it's trying to find the balance between those two types of thinking. Like, how do I feel, and what what am I observing, and what data points do I have? You mm -hmm. know, and in in climbing, I was always trying to minimize risk by looking at the factors and limiting exposure. So if if risk is the probability of something happening times uh, the consequence of it happening, if you can do that math. Uh, in as much detail as you can, at least you're doing something. <laughs> at least you're trying to break it down into pieces mm, that sure. your brain and body can understand. You know, I've said this before, but um, something that's been really, really helpful for me that I learned in the backcountry with skiing is uh, there was there's a guy in our in our local community who gives really great talks on decision making, and this is for backcountry skiing, not for not for paragliding. Although I had him come and talk to our club too because I thought it was so good, but. He talks about, well, you know, fast forward, you're, you're thinking about skiing this, this line and you know that what the hazards are or could potentially be. If it goes, if you screw this up and it avalanches and you wrapped around a tree, imagine what the, the accident report would read. Same as in climbing, you know, it, it, just think about that because that, and that's a good way to highlight and expose you're, you're on the way to Blackhawk, you're tired, you got a bad ankle, you're a little overconfident, you've got all these things. So in an accident report, all that stuff comes out because a good accident report is like, you know, what we've learned from TEM with airlines, they go all the way back. What were the threats? What were the errors made along the way? And you start looking like an idiot when you think that, when you think that, when you start thinking about the accident report you go wow i would not want to be that accident i would not want to be the victim in that accident report you know you've already made all these bad decisions before you're even thinking about dropping in you know so anyway keep going i i've i've just i've brought that into flying a lot more because i think it's a helpful way to just think about it because we often are tired dehydrated all those kind of things and you really do have to decide, okay, is this the day to step off the hill? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, I, and what I ended up writing in that letter uh, to come full circle in a, a little bit is to imagine that what if, mm. you know, to, to play that game of what's the worst case scenario, what's the backup plan, what is a safe exit in LZs, do I have margin? And think about those things and don't just go for it. Mm. Yeah. And that's that was kind of the – and in climbing – I, like you said in skiing there were good accident reports and i read those and i get you get that voice in your head the next time you're out that's like sure. you know gavin you know this this age this you yeah. know this experience level put himself in this position and i do think that is super helpful because it causes visual visualization and sure and uh it forces you to imagine yourself in the worst case scenario and i found the same with climbing if, if you're going to place protection on a trad lead you have to visualize what it would look like if you fell 
and how what swing you're going to take, what direction of uh, force is going to be applied to your uh, your piece, your anchor. And so all of that gets you comfortable with the idea of visualizing these scenarios mm. and then mitigating the risks uh, where you can and accepting some when you can't. Um, sure. And so like when you talk about flying through the pass low, I think you're, you're doing that. You're like, I'm going to land. If I have to land, I'm going to pick like this soft tree where my feet are still on the ground. But I think in the beginning stages for a pilot, they, they don't think that far ahead. You know, they're, they're, you know, they might land in a much worse scenario. There. I don't think they know to, I don't think right. they know how to. Right. Yeah. There's uh, you're, like you said, don't know what you don't know. Okay, yeah. so you're a black hawk. Yeah, coming, coming coming back. <laughs> things are things are kind of working against you in a sense. You don't yeah. really probably know that at the time. But well, so I in this situation, I think there were visual indicators. Well, there was the physical ones, uh, the exhaustion and fatigue and uh, some pain and uh, again some new equipment and a little bit of overconfidence perhaps uh, or or building myself up so I could pull this off. Um, it was very strong and I think again switchy on launch it was I, I visualized the wind was wrapping around the ridge a little bit and coming back at launch and then I think it was there was some pretty strong thermals just off launch and uh, my first attempt I think I caught some woody brush up there and so I, I packed it up for a second and watched the other pilots Othar was amazing he got off and out of there you talking about Othar Lawrence yeah he was out there with you guys oh yeah I didn't know he's still doing it. Right <laughs> well, this was uh, maybe a year and a half or two or three ago, two, two years ago, maybe. Wicked. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Be you know, just an amazing person to watch fly. And uh, my friend Peter, who has more experience than me, took off and he flew this flight path that kind of took him, I don't know, lookers or, or, or launchers left, if you will. <laughs> and uh, and I watched his wing oscillate in that way, uh, you know, where it pitches way back. And then forward again, the way back and forward again, which I would now correlate with some rotor, mm. whether it's mechanical or third or thermic. And, uh, and I remember seeing it and thinking, well, I can handle that. You know, like I, you know, he handled it. I can handle it. I've had training and, uh, and it led him to the thermal, you know, and he flew, flew out and sure enough, I flew basically the same course, uh, from launch and, um, the first 10 seconds go by and uh, I get a little lift uh, to, I'm trying to visualize now, but I think the east side of launch. And then I come back to more of the west side of launch and get into that area where he'd I'd noticed those pitches and that pitch activity. And I start to feel it, you know, like a, like that roller coaster feeling that none of us really <laughs> enjoy. Mm -hmm. I go back and then forward and I check it and then back and then forward and I check it and then back. And the next thing I feel was new to me. And it was sort of like the wing crumpled or deflated or was just going down, you know? And I think that I had just, and I had maybe just experienced a bit of uh, shear or downward force from the backside of a, of both uh, being in the lee of the thermal and, and, and the terrain. It sounds like maybe a lot of break from checking it. it perhaps, because what happened next was um, it, it essentially did frontal and... Oh. My hands fell way back, like you said, in, in doing a ton of break to compensate for that falling backwards, mm -hmm. right? Like um, riding the roller coaster, feeling the wing kind of start to deflate, lost the brake pressure, and then buried the, the hands to find it, mm -hmm. both because I was losing my balance falling backwards and because I, uh, you're always taught to follow the brake pressure. But there's always exceptions to the rules, and in this case, yeah. right? Like I, I went from a frontal to a stall, and knew enough to, from there to like put into backfly. But my brain was slow to kept, catch up. I just, I was holding in backfly, looking at the wing, being like, "Why aren't you flying?" You know, and knowing I didn't have a lot of train clearance. This is 20 seconds into the flight. <laughs> this yeah, happened so right off launch, yeah. And um, and I'm like, okay, well then fly, and I let my hands up, and I the right tip was uh cravatted or just didn't didn't fly properly and i went right into an auto rotation like got thrown right into it and at least from the siv experience i could recognize that and uh and i was like oh i'm in, I'm in an auto rotation you know and i start to sort of slow it down a little and it, that tip banged open and i was like oh i'm in a spiral now and i knew i could solve that configuration that i could pull out of it but i also knew i drifted back over launch and if i 
and was wrong about what I was seeing out of the corner of my eye. Like I thought I had the train clearance, but if I was wrong, or if I didn't perfectly pull out of the spiral, like I knew I was dead, Mm -hmm. like straight up. So, um, something else in my head took over and I found that handle and, uh, and, and threw it and it opened like a gunshot, like, like immediately. Cause I think there's a lot of energy in the spiral Sure. and, uh, went to depower the wing and then looked down and realized I was about to land. <laughs> and so I landed with, I landed probably within like five seconds of, of throwing. Yeah. So that was a, done. I landed, I, I fly, I probably am all up. I'm, 110 kg but i fly with a 140 kg reserve um i know everyone can have their choices and we could talk at length about that um i think for my primary reserve knowing i have one of that size for a softer landing is nice um mm, yeah especially in this terrain yeah. especially in blackhawk those right. those of you listening don't know it. this is just a desert mountain site with uh, a lot of rocks that's black rock and it's pretty um pretty helter skelter out there and helter it's, pretty, it's, it's, it's pretty raw <laughs> yeah you know it's it's big air yeah and uh you know it's not a, it's it's not grassy alps no no yeah i i landed on my feet and that was wonderful a nice soft landing but my reserve and wing went into these bushes that they, did, they didn't do any damage but it took forever mm. to get out of those like this like if you think you know, if you let your lines dangle while you're collecting them, or if you drag them on the ground for a second, you're looking at another 30 minutes. Yeah. And I was really fortunate. Uh, I was right near the the road up, if you want to call it a road. <laughs> it was yeah. very off-road. And Fast Eddie, who is our retrieve driver, who's kind of a legend around here, came up and, and he, like, started to braid all the lines into, like, daisy chains so that they wouldn't keep catching. And he helped me get out of there. And we even got the reserve container because it had landed right next to me. <laughs> Wow. that's how close it was so um a lot of lessons learned leading up to it and then again i can't say enough about putting the work in i knew there might be uh, from your podcast some mental recovery required and then some physical practice in, in my instincts needed and so i did i think i did two sivs after that to to work specifically out what had happened Mm. Um, and, and the first one of them was the most critical one. And Dylan worked with me on completely reproducing what had happened in that specific scenario. So we went up and I pulled huge frontals on bar and would even stall it at will from there, from the frontal and then recover the stall, you know, and, or go into extra, you know, find ways to do extra energized Asymmet- uh, asymmetric collapses into auto rotations and we sort of invented together a few maneuvers that allowed me to restore my confidence and rebuild those instincts i think that configuration i mean it sounds like well it sounded like a you had had enough training which a lot of people don't to recognize what was going on and that's a big deal i, I mean you know most people uh when they're you know, learning or haven't done a ton of SIV when you ask them what just happened they're they have no idea well the wing just collapsed or whatever you know the, but the whole process of it is very fast and they don't notice all the little things whereas someone who's had a ton of training can tell you exactly this is what happened this is how I lean this is where I put my hands um and most kind of bad cascades that I've seen are when you have the initial collapse and people instinctively, when you fall, you put your hands down. That's what we do as humans. And then they have no concept that their hands are too low. And so what do we do? We're heavier than a wing. We fall underneath the wing, the wings over our head and we get really confused. What the hell? Why isn't it flying? Well, it's not flying because your hands are below your ass. And but when you ask somebody, they will say, I, the first thing I did was what I was training is put my hands up. No, no look, <laughs> it, it wasn't because you're falling. It, it's, it's, it, it's very non-instinctual. I think it really takes a lot of training. We've talked about that quite a bit on the show, but it sounds like, you know, your hands were lower than you thought they were. And you're looking at your wing and why aren't you flying? And there have been several times, even for me, 
relatively recently, you know, I was on a, I was on a really rowdy flight with Matt Beechner last spring and our spring in, in Sun Valley can be really, really, really on very, very sharp, very strong, very cold. So you're, you're battling the elements in a sense. And, um, I three times on the flight, I spun the glider and, and it was just incredibly confusing, you know, and I was having to just do this really dramatic to me, let the glider fly, you know, cause I just, you know, I was in the, I was in this kind of, okay, my hands are, I'm looking at them going, my hands are definitely high enough for this glider to fly, but I trade, I use a lot of different gliders. I move around on gear constantly. And, you know, this is one I hadn't flown in a while. The brakes were a little, they, they were, I actually extended them after that because to me that, you know, I was up in the pulleys and this thing wasn't going. And, you know, it was, it was very, I think if I hadn't had all the SIV training and acro training that I've done, it would have been pretty confusing. Why isn't this thing going, you know? Oh, absolutely. And I think myself included, when you get to higher aspect wings, like that spin point, you know, on certain wings can be quite soft or quite high and you're trying to also turn tight right to to stay in course and if your turning side falls this this almost got me the, the other day the, the turning side falls out of a, a tight bubble like we have here in santa barbara you better be ready to to release her mm. or you're going into a spin and we've had a few pilots with with issues with that you know yeah so um that sensitivity comes with the training and i think comes with time and it's great to hear you talk about it because i think you've put so much thought into all these different scenarios different conditions and different pieces of equipment have you in, the, and I know there've been other instances, but I think we've tapped several that are great and they're not, you know, um, there are instances that happen to a lot of pilots, but if there, is there ever been in the last three years, four years, you started flying, um, uh, in your 700 hours, has there ever been a sitting at home moment where maybe this isn't right for me. This isn't maybe, or has it always just been, yeah. Oh, I, I, yeah. Has there ever been, a, is there ever been a real doubt? Cause you know, like you said, the, you do have a big community here mm -hmm. and there is a lot of feedback and some of that hasn't been easy mm -hmm. to digest. Right. Uh, you know, where, where I fly, you're lucky if you get any feedback because usually you're totally alone. So a lot of times you can just run and hide from this stuff. It's a, it's an incident that's happened to you. You don't have to post it. Nobody has to know about it. You can walk, run run away with your your tail between your legs and process it or not right right um i think to answer that uh absolutely not i never doubted that i would continue flying cool. <laughs> which i never would want to put other members of the community at risk or their access at risk sure Though that's a real you know a, a, a real concern in this area i would say like we need pilots to be making smart decisions we have a lot of pilots trying to launch together or fly together um, just because the, the triggers are, you know, the, the thermals are tight and there's very, you know, key triggers. Mm -hmm. And so everyone needs to learn together and progress and improve every day. And I don't think you can afford to hide your mistakes in a tight knit community and you, nor should you, like, I think it should be open and accepting and positive though if there's a series of events right then then it gets harder to handle um for me uh these it, you know we can list out these things now but while I, they do constitute maybe a series of events where i could pick out some extra items that i need to work on like some um key themes if you will that you know that may run true for each of these instances those are the things i, I should tackle first and that's what i tried to do uh but all of it stemmed from really the joy of wanting to be in the air and have these adventures and experiences, hopefully with friends, hopefully for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so there was never uh, even a doubt because of how much I love doing it that I would ever quit or stop doing it. Yeah. <laughs> what's your, what's your perception now of your skill level after, you know, going through all the SIVs, mm -hmm. you've had some, pretty fun, successful flights this year, uh, cross country, you know, uh, some personal best, uh, some, an extremely high flight <laughs> Talk to, about that. to 17, nine, 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 something. Yeah. Um, and, but what, what's, what's your, 
how do you perceive where you are now? Yeah, I guess I would, uh, I think I have the confidence to, to stay with, uh, some of the better pilots out there, uh, or at least the, the knowledge and skills are available to me, um, to attempt distance on big days and in big conditions. But, uh, in terms of on a spectrum of progression, I think I'm at the very beginning. And so that's an interesting, I guess, mental state to be in is that, um, I know the skills are there. I know that I either have the knowledge or it is readily available to me. Um, but I still have this sneaking suspicion. I'm, I'm not doing nearly enough homework. You know, I'm not doing nearly enough reading. I'm not learning enough about weather conditions, forecasting and various sites that I want to fly at. And I, uh, I also know that I have a full-time job, so I'm not getting to pick necessarily my days as much or, or train as much as I would like to. And finally, I just know that I, I only have an ounce of the experience of pilots in this community and pilots in the wider scope of flying. So, um, I both feel like I have the potential to, to do well in a big day, but also know that I have a long way to go before I can understand the more complex, the, com the complex factors at work on a day that involves multiple types of terrain, uh, different changing winds at different levels of, of the atmosphere and being able to make uh, the right course decisions to, to open up a challenging day. Can we talk about the spectrum a little bit more about, I think your Blackhawk flight is a good one to use as an example. On the one hand, you've got, you've got to be confident. You just have to, you can't do this sport without having confidence. On the other hand, you've got to have a lot of respect for it and fear is a good thing. How, can you talk about the balance there between the two? You know, and it, on the one hand, you know, we, to fly well, we've got to charge. We've got to make mistakes. That's how we learn. And yet we're doing it with a sport where there's no rope. Yeah. Yeah. So. There's, <laughs> you can't just uh, yeah stick your neck out all it's the a, time. It's a pretty nasty lead fall. Yeah. Yeah. Good. That's a good uh, comparison. I guess. You, you talked about that a bit with your post mm -hmm. with, the, with the the pilot we've been kind of talking about here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I try to break it down a little bit, and I guess when it comes to um, how to gain skills and experience without learning the hard way. Uh, and in in my past, I actually I created a ice climbing club to do that in mountaineering. Like mm. I, I ran ice climbing events. Uh, for about 10 years, uh, where we would instruct and teach. And, and within the club itself, we self-educated as much as we could to prevent that learning the hard way. Uh, can you practice these things uh, in a safer environment and then build them back together when you need them in the scenarios that require all skills at once? Like, I don't think it's necessarily easy to learn on a big mountain day because there's so much going on. If you're not, especially if you're not at that level, if you're not, if you're a little over your head, you're going to go way beyond uh, the mental capacity to take it all in, process it, especially in the moment, but even afterwards sometimes. Like you were saying about someone's wind control incident, they might have be like a car wreck and they don't, they can't piece together what's happening mm. or even afterward have a memory of it. And I think mountain flying can be the same, especially the higher wind environments in, in the mountains. Like I think things can happen just so fast to someone that they're not visualizing processing the way the air can be moving and responding to it. So my advice to that pilot was to build non-mountain hours. And that's something that's special about Santa Barbara. We can go fly the coast and you can just get airtime under your wing, watch how it moves, what it needs, uh, do pitch control, watch other pilots. And those powers of observation are really going to keep helping you again and again. And so is that need to continue to put the work in and practice mm. and do it in an environment that isn't going to punish you. And we, to that point, we also have a training hill here. And I think a lot of communities have that. And so going there frequently, I think I, I think I wrote, if I don't go there once a week, I don't deserve to fly the mountains. I think I wrote that. Right. Yeah. And that that's maybe a little strong. I sometimes I don't make it to the training hill, but uh, I think going there, especially if it's a training hill where you can 
uh, watch how you perform near the terrain and, and watch others and then practice things like side hill and top hill, top landings. Um, you know, I know I need to go back there cause I was trying to land with you and Willie, uh, mm. two days ago, yesterday, yeah. two days ago. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and I wasn't feeling great. I just had that COVID shot and I was on the heavy kit and I have a lot of excuses, but I didn't really fully commit to it. And, uh, generally I think that stems from not practicing enough. Mm. Like always, like you gotta be honest with yourself. Like, mm. um, there are a lot of, I don't ever want to commit to a top landing that isn't right. I mean, that's something I've heard on this podcast many times, yeah. but I do want to be proficient at it. I want to be able to do it. Like, I think that's the dream. And that's one of those, you know, frontiers that I think, like if I'm on the spectrum, right? Like maybe that spectrum applies to each skill set. And when it comes to top hill, and side hill and tight landings, like that's one that, man, you're always going to have to work on that. And it's going to be forever before I'm like, yeah, no problem. You know, I got, yeah, no problem. I got that. You mm. know, in fact, I don't ever want to probably feel that way with something with consequence like that. Like I always want to take them seriously. I always consider myself a beginner and someone who's learning. Mm. And, uh, and again, like I said, anytime you just are complacent, it's going to slap you down. Mm. So having a, having a training hill to practice at and do those things again and again is going to give you the confidence to execute it in a calm and collected way. And then it's going to allow you to um, know when it's right or wrong. And uh, and all of that's going to save you from having a serious injury when you do it for real. What what little things do you love and appreciate about flying? What kind of keeps you fired up? Because we go through we go through ruts and valleys. No, peaks and valleys. Ruts and valleys are the same, right? <laughs> um, and for, you know, for... For a lot of people, it becomes kind of a lifetime of flight, hopefully, and you know it never gets dull, but it it's different at different stages. Have you had any lulls, or have you had any? Yeah, what keeps you fired up about it now? I just don't know if that's ever been a problem. I am always fired up. <laughs> you seem pretty fired. Yeah, up. Well, I just said I think the again the people I get to fly with always impress me. Um, and I learned so much from them. And then, uh, because I work a full-time job, the only thing that is difficult is when I get, when I, is how much self-awareness I have to have after like a long week or a long day, mm. you know, th there might be a great opportunity to fly, but I might have to make sure that I'm mentally and physically prepared for it now in a way that I didn't really have to. When I first started flying, actually, I was working part-time and that was hugely helpful to have the consistency and the progression. Um, I did find that flying all of the time kind of did cause that like little burnout where you're, and that burnout isn't necessarily, oh, I don't want to fly today, but it's sort of like maybe a loss of experimental thought while you're out there. You're like, oh, that's that trigger and I know what it's going to do. Oh, that's that thing. I know what it's going to do. Or, oh, the day's pretty much over. I'm going to go land. But when you only have a couple days a week and the day is good, like you're not, like, don't, don't tell me to land. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I want to like see what's going to happen. I want to have that adventure. Um, I want to take it as far as I think it can go. And I'm open. I'm more open to what's right around the corner, you know, not calling it early, not assuming that a trigger is not going to work, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's helped motivate me even more, but I have to have the self-awareness to know that I'm ready for the day. And borrowing from, from others, some of those strategies, it's like making sure I'm packed the night before. It's not even something I used to do, but doing that and giving back to the community by writing letters like I did on Telegram or working on the board or trying to protect our access to sites uh, is all stuff that I try to do in the time I'm at a desk so that later if I, hopefully someone helped me out with a ride or like, or I overpay for gas, for example, because God, I'm so happy if someone will drive me up, you know, or help me with logistics. If I can get out at a little bit early and we can go soar the back country, you know, that's, that stuff's such a relief and so important to me that, um, you know, I try to put that into the same boat as all my other preparation. What can I do to kind of smooth logistics out or get a little extra support from someone in, on the team, you know? And so, so all those factors have helped me kind of get out more and stay more psyched. Final question, because uh, my girls just showed up here, so this is this will this will be a good uh, wrap. Uh, you've got a significant other, Kate, I believe. Yep. What does she think about all this madness? 
Well, actually, I just signed up for my tandem. Ah. So we'll see. And she's she's been working on her P1 and P2 for a while. Oh, wow. Um, I think we both know that there's a lot of risks involved. I You mentioned a flight where I took off uh, somewhat underdressed. I think it was maybe one of my first flights on, big flights on a two-liner as well. And I ended up, I was soaring the edge of a cloud at 17,000 feet or so. And then, um, which is super rare, I think, in the backcountry here. It was during a, a heat wave. Yeah. Um, and ended up gaining a lot more altitude than that <laughs> as I tried to exit. So I was flying toward the edge of the cloud being like, oh, these clouds, they've been benign all day for the most part. Great street ahead of me. I'm going to go out to the sunny side and get some clearance and uh, and got caught in what my barrier said was like a 13 plus Whoa. meter second bubble. Jeez. Yeah. That um, had me in the cloud for a few seconds. Um, and I think in those moments I focused on three things, which was breathing <laughs> uh keeping the wing open and maintaining the heading to, mm. uh toward that op- the line the cloud line that I was aiming for yeah and uh I felt the wing kind of go out in front of me and that's at least what I thought I felt in the white yeah, wing you in know clouds it's hard to tell yeah you're doing? like what's going on and uh it stayed totally open inflated almost like I was slipping off of a bubble yeah and then I kind of came back under it and came out of the cloud and oh my god like it was it was super beautiful and everything but I think and I don't, then I was up there at, um, am I supposed to say altitude? It's probably not a good idea. You just say tall. I you was were, really you high. Were, you were really high. <laughs> I was yeah. up there. Higher than you should have yeah, been. Yeah, let's not go. Yeah, I didn't I didn't actually share that track log publicly either. Um, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, you know, I, I was pretty cold up there. And it was a good point of reflection, you know, about being prepared for this, but also being prepared with the people you care about. Mm. You know, the whole thing isn't something we talk about a lot, but, uh, she's always been really supportive and I imagine eventually there'll come a time when I'll dial it back, Mm. uh, for sure. But I do also encourage everyone to kind of fly the pilot, you know, you are, you know, fly, fly that way. Uh, you know, when we talked about feedback from the community, one thing that bothered me in the past was generalized responses, like sort of like, Oh, dial it back a bit. Right. And I don't think that's hugely helpful because then pilots might fly with hesitation. They might, they might fly with someone else's voice in their head or they might doubt their decisions, which I think is just as hazardous. Mm. And so in my letter that, um, that I wrote on telegram, I tried to give very specific ways that a pilot can put the work in and very specific ways to improve. And those are things I'm going to work on, not necessarily just dial back a bit, but just how every little piece of the process can be more proficient Mm. and, always like you said visualizing the worst case scenario and leaving the margin jeff terrific man thank you so much for sharing all this with with all of us and i wish you great success with all this madness that we're embarked on and thanks man yeah your time this has been awesome thanks so much kevin If you find the cloud-based mayhem valuable, you can support it in a lot of different ways. You can give us a rating on iTunes or Stitcher, or however you get your podcast. That goes a long ways and helps spread the word. You can blog about it on your own website or share it on social media. You can talk about it on the way up to launch with your pilot friends. I know a lot of interesting conversations have happened that way. And of course, you can support us financially. This show does take a lot of time, a lot of editing a lot of storage and music and all kinds of behind the scenes cost so if you can support us financially all we've ever asked for is a buck a show and you can do that through a one-time donation through paypal or you can set up a subscription service that charges you for each show that comes out we put a new show out every two weeks so for example if you did a buck a show and every two weeks it'd be about 25 dollars a year so way cheaper than a magazine subscription and it makes all of this possible. Uh, I do not want to fund this show with advertising or sponsors. We get asked about that uh, pretty frequently, but I, for a whole bunch of different reasons, which I've said many times on the show, I don't want to do that. I don't like having that stuff at the front of the show. And I also want you to know that these are authentic conversations with real people, and these are just our opinions, but our opinions are not being skewed by sponsors or advertising dollars. I think that's a pretty toxic business model. So I hope you dig that. Um, you can support us. If you go to cloudbasedmayhem.com, you can find the places to support. You can do it through patreon.com forward slash cloudbasedmayhem. If you want a recurring subscription, you can also do that directly through the website. Uh, we've tried to make it really easy, and that will give you access to all the bonus material, a little video cast that we do and extra little uh, 
nuggets that we find in conversations that don't make it into the main show, but we feel like you should hear. We don't put any of that behind a paywall. If you can't afford to support us, then just let me know and I'll set you up with an account. Of course, that'll be lifetime and hopefully in a, you're being in a position someday to be able to support us. But you'll find all that on the website. Uh, all of you who have supported us or even joined our newsletter or bought Cloud-Based Mayhem merchandise, t-shirts or hats or anything, you should be all set up. You should have an account and you should be able to access all that bonus material now. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate your support and we'll see you on the next show. Thank you.